I'm Dr. John and this is your Maintenance Minute. I'm going to talk about mean time between failure, but actually I want to talk about two different types of reliability metrics. Mean time between failures, Ramesh Galati tells us in his book, is synonymous with reliability. And I want you to keep in mind, whatever your definition of reliability is, I'll remind you what mine is. It's kind of a street definition. It's, a, it's an asset will do what it's supposed to do when it's supposed to do it for as long as it's supposed to do it. So the assumption is it was designed to do what it is we need it to do and that it's actually doing what we want it, we need it to do. So we're not operating outside of the design parameters of an asset. So let's just say reliability and mean time between failure are synonymous as Mr. Galati points out that, uh, that that is the case. So mean time between failure is actually a measurement of reliability metric that we use on a repairable asset. So for example, a pump, electric motor, a gearbox, something that is repairable, a conveyor. It doesn't have to be a component. It can actually be an asset too, an air compressor, something like that. Mean time to failure is a reliability metric that we use uh, when we're measuring sort of a period between failures, something that's non-repairable, like a light bulb or a fuse or a bearing, for example. Now they're calculated exactly the same way. It's runtime divided by number of failures gives you the same number. The only difference is mean time between failures meant to be for repairable assets, mean time to failures for non-repairable. However, for our purposes, quite honestly, they're interchangeable. I don't suggest that you change anything you're doing now. Just remember in this little short discussion on mean time between failure, that what we're trying to do is we're trying to increase the period of time between when we replace a component or put an asset back into service to when it fails again that period of time we're trying to increase that so essentially we are if you if you remember mean time between failures synonymous with reliability we're increasing the reliability or it's that amount of time between those two instances and we can do that by doing the kinds of things that we do while we're working together with production and engineering so a piece of equipment running reliable we need to determine or may be able to measure what that period of time is now i had a client years ago that had a little had a little electric motor that ran for I think it had 15,000 hours on it, but they didn't know how many hours it had on this motor. And it failed at about 12,500. There was a lot of panicking and a lot of gnashing of teeth and rending of clothing until somebody, you know, why did this motor fail? It caused a lot of downtime. But then somebody discovered that this little motor that was rated to run for 15,000 hours had been running for 12,500 hours. And uh, I suggested maybe that motor actually ran pretty well. I mean, if you think mean time between failure, even mean time to failure, Mean means average, so if the mean time between failure is 15,000, you think of it as a bell curve, it's not, it's not outside the realm of possibility at 12,500, it's kind of on the tail, you know, the beginning of that bell curve, 15,000's in the middle, maybe like 17,500's over on the extreme right hand side. So what we want to do is keep in mind that an asset has a mean time between failure, the entire asset, and that the components inside of that asset that make up that asset also have their individual mean time between failure, or if you will, mean time to failure. And through that, we can calculate exactly how long we expect that asset to last. And more importantly, we can determine which one of the components that make up that asset is the limiting factor. And then we can make all kinds of great and awesome maintenance programs around the limiting factors and the limiting components. I'm Dr. John, and this has been Maintenance Minute.